So talking about tourniquet placement, again, if I have a high volume venous bleed or an arterial bleed, I'm typically going to go straight to the tourniquet. At a minimum, a tourniquet can be used as a stopgap, which goes against the old conventional wisdom, but we did it uh, in combat all the time. You place a stopgap to stop that bleeding so that you can finish whatever it is you're handling and then come back and reassess it and see whether or not that's necessary or not. Uh, so it, when you're talking about combat, whether you're military or law enforcement or someone that's in a gunfight, if you have a gunshot wound, you don't know exactly where it is and you're still actively in that fight, you don't have time to assess where that wound is exactly. You just know it's on the arm or it's on this arm or it's on your thigh, on your leg, what, what have you. So typically what you'll do in kind of the heat of the moment to stop that bleed is go as high as possible, all right? All the way up to the armpit before you put it on, all right? And once you get it in place, you wanna get this as tight as possible before you secure it down because you don't want to, you wanna take all that slack out of here before you start using the windlass to make it that much tighter because you're trying to compress tissue and push that artery against the bone in most cases, or in some cases a, a vein. You're trying to press that against the bone with that pressure. You know, once that gunfight's over and you're in a safe area, then you can strip these clothes off, cut these clothes off, whatever you have to do, and assess where the actual injury is. For a remote wilderness emergency, which is the context of this video, you probably know exactly where the wound is. So going straight as high as you need to go is not always the best case, right? Your goal with this is to stop the bleeding. And if it's in a remote wilderness scenario where you're not really in danger of taking on more injury, if I know that the injury is right here, then I'm gonna go and place my tourniquet two to three fingers above the wound, right? And the same thing that I'll do if I apply a tourniquet in more of a combat situation up high, if I reassess later that the only wound is down here, then I'm gonna move that tourniquet down or I'm gonna replace a tourniquet here and take this one off, all right? Because there's no reason to occlude the blood flow way up here if my wound is only down here. In the heat of the moment, you don't know where it is, so you place it as high as you possibly can to make sure you occlude the blood flow to all of the arm. So that's kind of the difference in placement. But if I know exactly where it is and I'm not in danger, then I'm gonna go two to three fingers above the wound. Take out all that slack and secure that off without securing the windlass yet. Then from there, I'm going to turn that windlass until the bleeding is stopped and I no longer have a distal pulse, okay? Those two things are the things I'm looking for. The bleeding has stopped here, but there could still be some retracted arteries in here and you, should, you could still be losing some blood here. So you wanna make sure that you've occluded that blood flow by checking the distal pulse, all right? At this point, the pulse should be absent. And if that's the case, the bleeding is stopped and there's no distal pulse, then I know that my tourniquet is tight enough, right? If I still have a radial pulse, I may need to give it a turn or two more. Once I get it in, I'll secure this windlass and keep it from loosening by dropping it in this little keeper. With the cat that I'm using right now, you take the rest of that tail, place it inside there, and you can continue that on around. That just secures the tail and keeps it from catching on something and getting pulled out and loosened. With this, it has a tab that you can pull over. And you're gonna annotate the time that you place this tourniquet on there with the marker that you have in there or any other instrument you have that you can write on that. So that is how you apply that. And then again, this intervention needs to stop the flow of blood and the arterial blood supply. So you're gonna check both of those things and you're gonna reassess this every 10 minutes or so until you're confident that this is what or that this is effective in controlling this bleed. Now let's talk about if this is not effective. If for some reason this is still bleeding, then you're gonna place a second tourniquet higher than the first, but directly next to it. So if this one wasn't effective, I'll place a second tourniquet just above that. In this case, I'll go ahead and use a ratcheting style tourniquet because that's what I have. And it'll show you the difference between the windless style and the ratcheting style. Same thing, place it over the wound.
pull this tight to take out all of that slack as you want. Plenty left over in your ratcheting system to actually apply additional pressure as you're clamping down. So it's important to get these as tight as possible with just the buckles and straps first. And then with this one, it's a simple lifting that actually tightens it. So you'll continue to lift that and it'll click in place and won't let any of that slack back out. Continue until the blood flow stops and you no longer have arterial flow distal to the wound, All right? From there, you can wrap this around and secure it off in this small little keeper here on the back to keep it from getting pulled out. So that's kind of the difference between the ratcheting style and the windlass style tourniquets and what to do if one is not effective and tourniquet placement. Again, if unknown injuries exist here, go as high as you possibly can. Place that tourniquet on, stop that blood flow, reassess when it's safe to do so. If this doesn't work here, one more above.